Good morning, everybody. This is the second panel Saturday about industrial hemp here at the Hemposium. This is where the hemp comes out in Hemp Fest. This is where we're trying to make everybody understand what hemp is about and why we need, still need to have this protest in the park, despite the fact that you can go to a store and buy some swag from the government. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we got some four great panelists today. I'm Donnie Wartshafter. I get to play grandpa in the room. I've been at it the longest. Uh, we got Ben Draws here, who's in Washington, D.C., being a lobbyist on behalf of Vote Hemp and the Hemp Industries Association. He's doing a great job bringing Congress around. He's going to tell you about it. We got Courtney Moran, who's a brilliant young attorney out of Eugene, Oregon, has been instrumental in bringing industrial hemp to Oregon. They're doing it down there without controversy, other than the issues with the marijuana growers. And we'll talk about that. We got Joy Beckerman Maher, who is a dynamo of activity, a hemp ace as a consultant, as a lobbyist. She almost got industrial hemp through the Washington legislature this year. And um, she, we'll hear about that. And then we got Dave Sieber and Hemp Shield. Dave's uh, been, been a, a, a great... Um, example of how to make hemp oil, hemp products go viral. He's actually got a product that's hitting the mainstream in the big box stores in a big way right now. And he'll tell you about his journey from um, trying to invent hemp building materials into actually creating a really uh, a new change in how we're going to take care of our houses. Yes. Um, let's start here with Ben and we'll go down and introduce yourself better than I did. Ben, tell us what's going on in Washington. Thank you so much, Donnie, and thank you so much for, for being here uh, in the symposium stage where we can really learn uh, about uh, hemp and the issues, so thank you so much for being here. I'm honored to be here. I'm from the other Washington, uh, in Washington, D.C., and so I'm very uh, uh, you know, honored to be able to work with the industry. I've been uh, lobbying in D.C. for uh, almost seven years now, uh, and I am working to uh, build support for the Industrial Hemp Farming Act. Uh, this is S-134 in the Senate and H.R. 525 in the House, and uh, we have been really making some really uh, positive and exciting headway. Um, not only with those bills, but with uh, amendments uh, to the appropriations bills uh, that have really been putting this in front of congressional uh, staffers and members. So uh, it's all really due to the calls that people get. Um, and so I'm here to, to help encourage people to register to vote, to get involved, to get engaged, and to call on Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell to co-sponsor the Industrial Hunt Farming Act, S-134. So thank you all for being here. And if you have any other questions, uh, I'll, 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 I'll stick around in the back for a little bit. Courtney? Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Moran and I'm an attorney in Oregon. Um, I advocate for the legalization of the cannabis genus and I think it's really important that we think about the whole plant and not just one specific use versus another and that we really focus on the value of what this genus can do for our environment and for public health. It is a really exciting time right now. I mean, in the last year, 14 states have legalized some form of industrial hemp cultivation. And overall, there are 24 states that have legalized cultivation. So we are making progress every single day. Uh, just on July 2nd, Connecticut became the 24th state to legalize hemp cultivation. So we really are making a lot of progress. In Oregon, this is the first uh, cultivation season, the first production season. We have 13 licensees, but only about six of them are cultivating. And I was fortunate enough to be in a field this past Monday. And it's just really incredible to see these plants growing on a large scale and the energy that this plant can give us and how it can heal our, our earth and our just public health in general and just improve public health. Um, 
So I encourage you, if you're living in a state that has not legalized hemp cultivation or isn't actually cultivating yet, to reach out to either your Department of Agriculture or to your senators and representatives and tell them that you want to see your farmers cultivating because that's what it takes. They have to know that we want to see it being grown. I mean, for so long, our farmers historically were cultivating hemp throughout the United States, but we've been in this, you know, 70 years of prohibition and farmers have not been allowed to cultivate but 30 other nations are cultivating. And so it's time for our farmers to really get involved and be able to participate in this market. And we can all have an impact and make sure that this does happen. Joy Becker, Minority, introduce myself. Um, what's interesting is that Despite that we have these 24 states uh, that have legalized, and we only have about five of them right now cultivating. And that is because we have a bit of a conundrum when it comes to getting hemp seeds. If you need good marijuana seeds, if you're looking to get into medical marijuana or the recreational marijuana business, you've come to the right place. America's got the most amazing marijuana seeds. You don't have to import those. Industrial hemp, not so much. The US government did not preserve the germplasm from the incredible cultivar that had been developed on American land when the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act passed. So we're sitting here now in what is an interesting opportunity that the feds have given us in terms of the passage of Section 7606, which was signed into law in February of 2014, passed by Congress and then signed into law by the President. And that's a very short amendment to what we call the Farm Bill, but it's really called the Agricultural Act of 2015, uh, 2014. Um, and. Uh, uh, and it says, hey, in states where you've legalized industrial hemp, your departments of ag, without any basically further legislation, can now um, promulgate rules in conjunction with institutions of higher learning to begin research uh, plots and even be able to research the word market is in there, which we think is a, is a hole big enough to drive a hemp truck through in terms of selling what is grown. However, a lot of folks then said, hey, great, Washington can do this because Washington has legalized industrial hemp. Well, Washington is, has not recognized this the one plant concept. In fact, Washington's state definition of marijuana, unlike the federal definition, it mirrors the definition entirely of the federal definition, except that in the state of Washington, we've added the qualifier containing greater than 0.3% THC. So, when we legalize marijuana, we legalize the cannabis sativa plant species, although they call it a plant erroneously, um, of containing greater than 0.3% THC. As a result, our Attorney General holds the opinion, and they're the ones who give uh, the advice to the State Department of Ag that says, we didn't legalize industrial hemp. Just this past week, an interesting email from the Liquor Control Board was sent to me and forwarded to me that said, um, yes, as somebody who wanted to grow hemp for CBD, he said, no, anything below 0.3% THC is a controlled Schedule One substance in the state of Washington and the Liquor Control Board does not regulate it and has not been legalized, in writing. So this is the conundrum under which we live. Um, and, and we need some form of regulation um, and we went to great, great strides, the Hemp Industries Association, and by the way, Courtney didn't mention, she's the president of the Oregon Hemp Industries Association. Uh, my counterpart down below, and I'm quite grateful for that. It's anytime we can get lawyers involved is a really great thing. Um, so in any event, we knew we needed to have some regulation and Health Canada, here's the clicker, is that Health Canada, Canada has legalized industrial hemp since 1998. They test fields to make sure that they're in compliance with their 0.2% THC and below. They actually have a different threshold for THC level in Canada than we do. It's even lower. Um, but in any event, they hire third-party uh, field test samplers who generate revenue for Health Canada by applying to be a field sampler, a licensed field sampler, and the, and the farmer pays them, not Health Canada, to go out into the field, collect a sample once a year. That field sampler drives it to a third-party authorized lab to test and get a certificate of analysis. All of that cost is borne by the farmer. It's fairly minimal. Health Canada is not involved in it at all except to receive the certificate of analysis and to approve the, the test sampler, who, by the way, is a professional agrologist, so has a master's degree in all of ethics like that. Here in Washington, the Liquor Control Board, we've legalized marijuana. The Liquor Control Board doesn't go out and collect the sample from the producer. Here, the producer, the grower, collects the sample themselves, drives it themselves down to a third-party lab, and gets that certificate of analysis. The Liquor Control Board is not part of that cost or that management. It didn't cost them any money at all. 
With industrial hemp guys, the, the WSDA decided at the last minute through the session, we'd had unanimous support in both houses. At the last minute, they said, you know what? We decided we want to be the ones to go out into the field to collect the sample. We want to be the ones to deliver the sample to a lab, which by the way, we're going to build ourselves. And we're going to spend several hundred thousand dollars and we're going to get a gas spectrometer, I mean a gas chromatograph and a mass spectrometer. And they built the fiscal note and fiscal concern up to $900,000 to run a simple industrial hemp program when Tennessee and Kentucky are doing it successfully for 25 or so. And that held up our bills in House Appropriations because the House Appropriations Committee said, hey, we think you're only going to generate 100 grand tops and the state of Washington is not going to fund a program that costs nearly a million dollars to run. Both of those figures are erroneous. They're not based in reality. The good news here, if there is to be a silver lining at all, is that we have a new director at the WSDA, was just hired a couple of months ago and he hails from the Department of Ecology. So we're hoping there maybe is half a hippie in there. <laughs> and, that, um, and, and we work well with the WSDA before, but they're the ones, again, who really interfered and, and botched this whole thing at the end for us. So I'm compiling uh, economic information for this director, and hopefully we'll write a good bill that will allow us to actually put seeds into the ground, because unlike 19 of these 24 states that have legalized, um, we, we want to be ones that will actually be able to plant and not write botch law and botch policy that doesn't allow any seeds to go into the ground. We really need to contact our state representatives as well as our federal for Senate Bill 134 that Ben was talking about on a federal level and say, listen guys, we need proper economic information here. Get this hemp bill done. We can do it for $25,000 or less. We need your help here in Washington on that, guys. Can I just follow up for one? Um, so about the testing, Oregon is the same way. So our Department of Agriculture goes out into the field, does their own inspections, does their own testing. They charge um, you know, $92 an hour to go out and do these inspections plus a $350 testing fee. And the irony is that on the marijuana side, they are able to go to their own private labs, you know, which costs, you know, significantly less. And it's, you know, industrial hemp is a non-psychoactive crop, it's an agricultural commodity, and the regulations around it are almost more strict than the marijuana regulations, and it's, you know, a little bit shocking to see the way that this is all playing out. Um, but it is exciting, you know, the 24 states have legalized, and this is the third production season for Colorado and Kentucky, or for Colorado, um, the second production season for Kentucky and Vermont, and then the first production season for Oregon, Indiana, Tennessee, and North Dakota. So we really are making a lot of progress, and although most of these states are only conducting research, Colorado and Oregon are doing full commercial cultivation also on top of the research. But Kentucky is unique because in the um, Section 7606 provision, they do allow for market research like Joy mentioned, and Kentucky is going to be conducting this market research, allowing some sales and also allowing out-of-state processing to really see the potential for this market and for great products like Dave Siebert's Hemp Shield. Hi, I'm Dave Siebert. I have been a cannabis activist for 48 years. I've specialized in the area of industrial hemp for building materials for 25 years. Today marks a 20 year span that I've been speaking here at the Hemp Fest, and today is the fifth anniversary or birthday for Hemp Shield, which was actually announced right here at the Seattle Hemp Fest. Now, for those of you who don't know what Hemp Shield is, it is the first commercially viable hemp containing building material and maybe, and of course I'm prejudiced, the best wood finish and deck sealer ever made. It is, it is. I agree. Yes, it is. <laughs> Rather than go on about its properties and all that, I will tell you that Hemp Shield is actually getting ready to break the, and take a national market share and we are at the point where we're looking for the right angel to help us take go with this next step, which is already in progress. And as I say, this is our fifth year. So I'm just going to talk about, this is what happened for the hemp shield in terms of hemp history this year. In June, Senator Ron Wyden, the senior senator from the state of Oregon, took a basket of industrial hemp products on the floor of the U.S. Senate, including hemp shield, and mentioned hemp shield by name. The same month, 
the Spikenard Farm and Honeybee Sanctuary in Floyd, Virginia, Mr. Gunter and Vivian Strauhauk, who are master beekeepers and teach other professional beekeepers how, how to do their profession, announced and are, and are recommending in all their seminars that they seal the hives with hemp shield because the bees like hemp shield. We also made a shipment this uh, last month, the first shipment to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo for the giraffe section. They're going to do the whole zoo with hemp shield because they know it's safe for their animals. And normally I've been happy to come up here for 25 years and talk about industrial hemp. And although I've been active in the other things, that's where I left it. But I didn't even know if I was going to be here this year. Last year, before I came, right before I came up here, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer, which turned out to be a pretty aggressive form of it. So I wasn't even sure if I was going to be up here. Now there's a Steve Jobs story that when the doctors pronounce the big C on you, it changes your whole state of consciousness. And from a certain point of view, you don't have as much to lose. So if there's anything that you wanted to say or that you wanted to do but you haven't been doing because it might interfere with your other stuff, you better do it. <laughs> I come to this realization and this is how it came out. This, this is called Jack Herrer's Revenge. I'd like to propose that we are now in a time period called Jack Herrer's Revenge. Jack, the deceased author of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, was entirely correct when he said cannabis is one plant that can provide multiple products and uses at the same time. Colorado, Oregon, and Washington to some extent now have legalized industrial, med medical, and recreational cannabis. So, it is now time that we advocate the removal of cannabis from the irrational classification system it is under completely by defining cannabis legally only by its end use. There should be no special restriction or taxation on industrial or medical use beyond what is in place for tomatoes, as was proposed to me by Ed Rosenthal, and, or any common vegetables. Recreational cannabis, if it is to be regulated at all or taxed, should be reclassified as class five. All cannabis growers should start rebreeding old and new varieties and growing multiple use biomass for fiber, seed for grain and oil, leaf and flowers for medicinal or recreational that can have any percentage of cannabinoids desired while being grown in both seeded and sensimia forms. This would eliminate any conflict of interest from all types of growers enabling to use any agronomic technique they want. And by the way, the idea of characterizing industrial cannabis by its THC content makes no sense whatsoever, especially now that CBD is being derived from industrial hemp. If we were to change things in this manner, and the price of recreational cannabis, it might fall as low as tobacco, but with an equivalent increase in overall sales size. And unless we put an excessive tax on it, it will destroy the black market for the plant totally. Isn't this what we all really want? Free the plant from those ignorance-based laws and regulations. If you want to save humanity and have sustainable human culture at the, on this planet, grow more hemp. That's what Jack said, and he was right. If we all get behind a concept with parameters like the ones I suggest, we could join forces behind a new model for cannabis, and we will end up changing the whole thing right up to and including the states, the federal government, and the United Nations, which has scheduled an emergency meeting in 2016 to reopen the single narcotic treaty and to modify it about cannabis and maybe take it out of the system. Thank you, Dave. So, so the last comment you have to, I'm sorry, I have to say, is I went home last year, I started juicing with the, with the fresh juice, I started the RSO, 
I was declared cancer free three months ago. And I can only do that because of the existing form of the Oregon laws, the new regulations that they're putting in. If that happened, I couldn't have gotten cured. And I wouldn't be here. Yep. Thank you, David. I'm so good to hear. All right, the, the theme of our discussion today is hemp on the horizon and the latest developments. So I want to ask our speakers, what are you seeing? What developments around the world are you most excited about? How are we learning to use hemp in the modern context? Ben? Uh, thank you. Um, well, what, what amazing speakers. I'm so glad to be next to such experts on this. So I can just, you know, offer my two cents on this. Um, you know, the pilot programs as authorized under Section 7606 of the Agricultural Act of 2014, as Joy mentioned, uh, that's very exciting because that really does allow us to really start growing and experimenting with the hemp plant in really a lot of ways. Um, we are in those 24 states. Um, we can actually, uh, we can technically start growing and researching hemp for any use, whether it's building materials, whether it's, of course, food and oil, or whether it's, you know, these exciting new developments with graphene um, and, uh, and other applications, um, you know, and really processing hemp. So I think that those are going to be really exciting. And, uh, you know, in Washington, uh, you, you know, uh, it's really unfortunate that's the situation and I picked up, there's actually a uh, couple tables for voter registration and they also have this booklet of state legislators. I would like us to focus on the actual industries if we could, that's what the topic is, yeah. the future. I'll just take that for a moment. Um, the really the most exciting things happening that are viable right now are fractionalization. This is what's blowing my mind. There's a company, Pure Vision Technologies, out of Colorado that has some patented research on fractionalization, um, which it, it is, is a way to take the stock, the entire hemp plant, but separate it from its cellulose, its sugars, and its linens to make a variety of commercial applications, everything from fuel to building materials to paper. And they have some amazing technology to be able to do that. They just need... what they want is to be within 50 miles of a feedstock supply and so they've even in Oregon you're very lucky um, they have they're gonna put a five acre uh, test plot um, or test facility commercial demonstration test facility in with an existing um, operation that is uh, by a river in southern Oregon Do you know where that is it's actually right off of the Columbian Boardman Oregon it's um, in eastern Oregon not too far from the Idaho border so they're taking fiber that's been they took fiber from Kentucky this year, fiber from um, Colorado, and uh, they are, have, have started in with their first 900 pounds of fractionalizing industrial hemp. This is amazing stuff. Another is biocomposite fillers. We're seeing even at Costco last week, I saw this flax filled biocomposite resin salad bowl set with tongs. You know, we can be filling all of these biocomposites with this beautiful, renewable, easy on the farmer, easy on the earth, fast growing, um, really robust, durable crop. Uh, and and uh, also, Ben mentioned graphene, nanotechnology, nanocellulose. We didn't see that coming 20 years ago. We didn't know that they were going to discover um, that, that hemp would be the most optimal op uh, biomass and biocellulose for these types of nano applications and, and biomedical application so we're seeing some really really exciting things on the horizon yeah. so on the immediate horizon MSHA will continue to be the pioneer in coatings and we hope to develop definitely look more lines of products we already have one new one that I can't talk about we haven't named yet and, we, and of course eventually we will make paint this is going to change a whole lot of things it sounds simple but it's actually a big I agree with what Joy is saying and that the future of what's going on is going to involve hemp with, with nanotechnology. I actually worked with the Burl Institute of Northwestern University over 20 years ago on producing the first uh, hemp fiber reinforced plastic fiberglass. Um, and this, the Burl Institute was put in charge of developing all the stealth materials. One of the things that happened from the study that they did with the fiber that I gave them, which by the way I got from Don Worshafter at the time, was that they said they saw no reason why you couldn't take the hemp fiber and treat it the same way they do the carbon fiber to make super 
as a stealth and strong materials out of, and that the only limitation to that versus using the the, the other the carbon-based stuff was that it would burn out over 165 degrees. But in terms of strength and flexibility and all the stuff that stealth that they were doing, it has all those properties. I also now hear that um, the best fullerenes come from hemp biomass. That when it's burned to, to make fullerenes, it's the best ones, and they, they have electro uh, conductive properties. That's so cool. I have to look that one up. That's really cool. Yeah. They're making that, bucky balls out of hemp. Right. This is great. <laughs> they're better than any, any other source to make them. Right in 1938, going on. In 1938, Popular Mechanics magazine reported that industrial hemp can be produced into over 25,000 products. That was 1938. So after 77 years of technological advancements and the research and development capabilities of today, the products that industrial hemp can be produced into is almost limitless. I mean, it is just going to be incredible the things that we see over the next, you know, couple of years, next decades of what's going to be produced from industrial hemp. What I see on the horizon is legalization. It's coming, it definitely is. There is no excuse for the laws that we have on the federal level today. The environmental harms that we are faced with can be alleviated with industrial hemp and we have to find a sustainable, renewable resource and industrial hemp is that resource. I also want to point out that one of the, uh, the pro hemp progenitors of this whole thing and a true man of the future is sitting out in our audience, Aguadas over here, who pioneered the use of hemp with pyrolysis, which is definitely the future of what's going to develop because it's one of the main intermediary steps that can be done with family farms that's not out of a scale that's unreasonable. Dave, to could do you explain to us what pyrolysis is? Because that's pyrolysis a very important Pyrolysis is the process of uh, burning biomass with no oxygen. And what that does is it releases. A, a heavy volatile gas that if you collect can be made into ethanol, methanol, biodiesel, gasoline, or plastic resins that are totally pure to the, to the tune of at least 30% by volume or weight of, what it, of, of, of the material that you use to do it. And the byproduct is biochar. And the hemp biochar can literally change world hunger. You take this biochar and you mix it up with uh, mycorrhiza to activate it and it, it literally, if you use it on, on agriculture, it immediately stops all nutrient runoff out of the fields. It ends the thing of agriculture and forest guys polluting the water streams. That's the, the first thing it does. It also reduces the amount needed of, of petroleum-based fertilizers up to 60% at the start. And if you keep doing it, it makes it so that you don't need it at all. And, and if we're getting really practical here, what David is saying is so important in that one thing we haven't mentioned yet in terms of all these developing industries that we're discussing is we are lacking infrastructure here in America because we do not have processing facilities to process the industrial hemp, which has, a, a, even though it has much less linen than trees and thus creates a much less toxic uh, paper and, and certainly far superior paper because it requires so much less uh, toxins in order to process. Well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get to do the third one in that not only does it do all those things for our farmers, but it increases the yield of whatever they're growing anywhere between 50 and 300 percent. And we are not told. going to need these processing facilities. So can you explain to us, Dave, how, how when we grow hemp, people say, oh, great, we're going to grow it. We're not going to be able to process it. But what you're talking about, we can do without a processing facility. Am I right? Not only is that true, but even a, it turns out that for pyrolysis, it, an investment for a, a production facility can be as, as little as a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars. Now, in agriculture, we're talking one tractor. This is not out of the realm of a family farmer being able to do. Okay? So this is one of the steps that we need to take so that we can go from nowhere to build up so that we finally get to the scale of a crop that could, that could actually support the big 
composite industries that I actually started working for and have enough yield at a decent enough price to do it. We need all these intermediary products, and the first step, I believe, is the, bi is the biochar. Okay, the so, pyrolysis. so this brings me to my next question, which is, like, what are these steps? What are the impediments? Why, what do we need to overcome to get to where we want to be? Ben? Um, politically? But, but politically, um, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act is what would completely remove industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, we have great support from a lot of senators, but we need more support. And so we are urging uh, people around the country to uh, make those calls to really uh, change those laws. Um, specifically, uh, the, the Senate bill is really what we're pushing for, and that would really be a complete and total game changer. Yeah, I mean, on the federal level, um, the House bill, H.R. 525, has 60 co-sponsors, but the Senate bill, 134, only has nine co-sponsors. So we, re and we really need to get the senators on board. Um, and back to legalization just in general, you know, in 1937 when we put in the Marijuana Tax Act and outlawed cannabis, and in 1970 with the Controlled Substances Act, this had ripple effects around the world in other countries you know, making cannabis illegal. And, but today, um, 30 other industrialized nations are cultivating hemp. And in Canada, what they started with in early 1990s was hemp research. And with just a couple years of research, they decided to go for full commercial legalization in 1998. So it's really exciting that, you know, although we are only doing research on the federal level and that's all that's authorized right now, that's all that it took in Canada for full legalization and we are on that path. We already have, you know, we're in our second year of production for research and this is going to show the federal government that we can and need to cultivate industrial hemp. So I really do think legalization is right around the corner. I know you're right, girl. I know you are. Another thing you need to do, we must do, is buy hemp. Don't buy regular tree paper. Buy tree-free hemp paper. Look it up. Tree-free hemp paper. There's someone in Colorado, Morris Beagle, an amazing revolutionary who decided, I'm going to get into the paper business, hemp paper business, until he discovered there's barely any hemp paper. I'm going to have to manufacture it myself. So he is. Tree-free hemp paper for your business cards, for your printing. They're making it as economical as they possibly can, but we have to decide as consumers, where are our real values? Well, you know what? Our real values need to be in tree-free hemp paper. Eat more hemp. Wear more hemp. Choose hemp. You're, if you have any wood or decks to seal, I hope you're going to go to hempshield.net, especially if you want to save labor and time. It is superior. Buy hemp, use hemp, eat hemp. Money, money speaks. You know, buy hemp products. It's a how we can build this industry. It costs a lot of money right now for U.S. producers because we're importing all of our hemp. You know, with all the research that's been done, only very limited commercial production has been done in Colorado and now in Oregon this year. But it still costs a lot. The transportation costs to get hemp here, especially if it's hemp fiber, increases our cost. So, I mean, that's why some hemp products are very expensive. But we have to speak with our dollar and show industry that we demand hemp products and that we are demanding that our farmers can't participate in that market. And I'm like sure to, that last 45 years is worth the $45. I'd like to introduce another, another concept that I believe is on the horizon that's going to be very interesting. There's a company over in Europe that has a process to, that they use with, with hemp that only uses water. I don't know the, the specifics of it, and they're being a little tight-fisted about letting it out, although they are on in Indiegogo looking for financing. It's called Zeoform, X-E-O-F-O-R-M. And what it does is it takes the hemp stock and makes it the consistency of styrofoam. Now there are already other companies over in Amsterdam who are taking giant 3D printers and using styrofoam and making houses overnight. How about we have overnight hemp houses? This is gonna this could come about in the next couple of years. And the the, the 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 thing the process that's used to make the hemp to do this is only with water. That's all I know about it. But that changes everything. That's coming. Right on. We'll have a couple minutes here for audience questions. Here, let me bring a mic out in the audience. Who's got a question for me? Everybody, this is another great hemp mystery. Mr. 
Sam Clowder from California. Hi, you're, you're reminding me, Joy, of what the founders of the HIA used to say back in the mid-90s, which is vote with your dollars. Oh, in that way, we can vote every day, every time, we, every time we spend a penny, if we do it consciously. What was the 800 number for the Ohio Hempery, Donnie? 800 by hemp. 800 by hemp. We'll never forget it. Well, we'll forget it, because it not gets you hemp out of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have had our hemp stores without you. Yeah, yeah and as, as far as buying hemp goes, just to say, you know, there are so many new hemp products. You know, if you used to buy hemp a few years ago, and you think, you know, a lot of people think that hemp shirts are uncomfortable, but there's they've come so far. So buying hemp now is much more exciting than buying hemp was uh, just a few years ago. And we're really excited about even more products coming onto the market. Another question here? Uh, just following on from what Dave Sieber said about uh, the, all of these uses like petroleum and in agriculture, are there any vested corporate interests that are conniving to keep this illegal uh, so that they can keep their profits like in big ag or you know petroleum companies it's interesting uh, we're seeing and there's a lot of this big bad evil corp sort of funding the green industry for their own reasons but but the reality is even they see that there's a finite supply of their petroleum fossil fuels even they see that so there's huge investment we don't have the the diversity that we used to have in fact one of the great besides the WSDA and their ignorance the greatest folks, believe it or not, and it, it pains me to say, who were against legalization of industrial hemp cultivation in the state of Washington, were not Evil Corp. It was the licensed, the certain sect of licensed marijuana growers that actually put the most money into it because of their hysterical fear of cross-pollination. So, uh, so our foes are much different than they used to be, and also, let's stay vigilant and continue to be a first so line of defense for Evil Corp. I can talk reliably about what's going on in the wood industry and that and such. I started my work right at the Washington State University. And not only did I get to talk to them and everything else, they explained to me, said, Dave, we don't even talk about wood. We're fiber guys. They said, I said, are you interested in this? They said, you bring us the Cadillac fiber to Plant Kingdom? You bet we're interested. I can show you a letter from what I consider the heaviest redneck lumber company in the United States, Roseburg Lumber from 1993, stating in writing that we know it works, we're ready, and by the way, it's the only worldwide-based industry where that's true, is for, is for composites, and we're ready to buy, we need 1,400 dry tons a day, 323 days a year. As soon as you're ready to be competitive, we're ready to buy. That was 1993. You could take all the hemp that's being grown in North America right now, and I'll throw in Europe and Russia too, and there's not enough to run a, either one factory for six months. Okay? Oh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> All right, we're gonna wrap this up, but I did want to do, introduce one more great hamster. I met Aguadas in the summer of 1990. We did, I had hemp seeds. I heard he had bought an oil press. So we met in Wisconsin and cobbled together the first, or the, actually the second pressing of industrial hemp seeds in America in about 75 years. And um, the first was done for Gatewood Galbraith's campaign to uh, run around Kentucky in a hemp car in uh, 1988. Um, and we used some of that oil to create the early hemp products. So Aguadas is, uh, you got anything to say? Oh, what a great panel we got here today. This is fantastic. It's so nice to be this close to the people that are shaking and moving things forward. Yeah, in 1990, I began pressing hemp seed oil, and uh, Donnie called, asked if I wanted a partner, and I said, I, my family's from Chicago, they never let me live it down. Uh, and, and I had to show I didn't have any plaster on my arm or my leg, but I said, I need a regular customer, and Donnie came through on a regular basis for years. Uh, we are currently in, all, in Colorado working uh, on, our, um, on a project inspired by the Chicago Board of Trade. The Board of Trade Hemp, both. And uh, we're doing the first part of our project is we're gathering economic information about the markets 
if you have participated in a, a transaction dealing with industrial hemp, please contact us and let us enter your information into the database. I have in my hand some water only separated fiber um, that's part of our biofractionation and Ed Lerberger has promised me a bucket of uh, his fiber for us to make some nice hand sheets of paper. Very exciting uh, things for people who used to go pale at the, at the mention of hemp. I've got some color in their face and a project in their eye. It's a very exciting time. Let's go, hemp. All right. Everybody, um, everybody take a minute to give a good two, 60 seconds to give a quick final uh, thought. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I don't even want to, there's so much uh, exciting stuff. I'm, it's, it definitely is a very exciting time for the hemp industry. Not only is it legal for the first time to grow uh, hemp under pilot programs, 24 states can do that, but we do need to get more uh, activism from people because uh, the state legislators, the uh, people from the state departments of agriculture, they need to hear from people. So, uh, you know, getting involved is important. Buying hemp is important. The market is what is pushing this. And uh, it's, it's, it is an exciting time, so get involved. Thank you so much. You're already involved because you're here, but thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Right, I agree. We need to buy hemp, speak with our dollar, call your senator's representatives. If you've never done it, it may sound scary, but it's not. You will likely be talking to a legislative staffer. All they do all day is answer phone calls from concerned citizens. You just have to call. You don't even have to identify yourself. Just tell them you want to see hemp grown. And I mean, that's really all you have to say. You can get into more details if you want. Join a local HIA chapter. Um, I don't remember how many states have, have theirs, but Oregon and Washington have great chapters. Get involved that way. And the best way for you to be involved is communicate with anyone that you see. No matter where you are, tell them that you support cannabis. Educate them on what you know. Speak to them and see what they know. And just education. I mean, that's how we can build this industry. A lot of people don't know the value of industrial hemp and the value of cannabis. But we are all educators and we can all build this together. And, and to really elaborate, the education, thank you, Courtney, that's really what it's about. Beware of the oversimplification of industrial hemp. Um, it was certainly my love of marijuana and my activity in the marijuana movement that allowed me to get interested in, frankly, the Grateful Dead, which led me to the hemp flyer that changed my life on some cellular level. Um, but education, education. It, so, so I say that because we don't want to just take your basic marijuana um, analogy and apply it to industrial hemp on every level. There, we're talking agriculture, and it's different when we're we're discussing agriculture on on some level. So, don't oversimplify hemp. Educate. One way you can educate yourself. The world's only course so far on industrial hemp is taught out of Oregon State University. I've taken the course. Anyone can I take the, the course. I took the course, too. It's fantastic. It's amazing. The president of the Hemp Industries Association, Andrea Herman, who has so many credentials at the end of her last name that I, 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 of course, I'm happy to. And Dave helped design it. Um, but, but I will tell you, the most important thing is that for $861, anybody can take this course. You have to do it when it's a scheduled semester, but you can do it in your pajamas in the middle of the night like I did. Um, and it will change your life. I thought that I was so intelligent on industrial hemp until I took this course and realized what an absolute fool I was. So if you are serious about getting into the industry and you think you'll have a fighting chance against the PhDs and industrialists who are already entering the industry, please take this course online, OSU eCampus. Here's a little tip on that. If you're over 65 and you contact the professor of the course, you can take it for 25 bucks. All right, I want we're to gonna... say that the vision is real, the vision is held on many, many levels. There's a lack of provisioning with the people who are doing this. If you, if you give us the right resources, we are going to take, make this happen for all of us. And right away, just back us to do it right. All right, everybody, we're wrapping this up. We are here Saturday. Seattle Hemp Fest Temposium. This was the Industrial Hemp Panel. Everybody stay tuned. Coming up now is a great panel, including Dr. Lester Grinspoon. Everybody, we want to thank Dodge City Sound, Zach and his crew for the great sound work we're doing here. We want to thank all the volunteers, the thousands of volunteers that make Hemp Fest possible. What really makes Hemp Fest possible is your contributions into the bucket. 
or you were hitting the donate button on your television screens. We need the cash. This year's been a really meager year for us. Yesterday was shut down. We're not going to get the contributions we normally get. We need your help now. Contribute to HempFest, please.